Hi, and welcome to Dr. Vanderveen's AP Chemistry Podcast. Tonight we're talking about kinetic molecular theory. Now, kinetic molecular theory is a theory that was developed over about a hundred year period, and it was primarily presented in its main form by Clausius, with the clausius clapeyron equation. All right, so what we want to do in this podcast are to discuss the main points of kinetic theory as it applies to gases, Of course, we can talk about solids and liquids as well, but our main focus here is the study of gases. We want to discuss deviations from the ideal behavior, which is what kinetic theory predicts. And we're going to introduce the van der Waals equation and talk about what that means in terms of kinetic theory. So there are a number of different statements, basically, of kinetic theory that were put together to help make the math manageable. What we know about gases is that they consist of large numbers of particles that are in continuous random motion. They're always moving. We have different kinds of motion. We can talk about rotational motion, spinning on a top. We can talk about vibrational motion, where um, it may be stretching back and forth. And we can talk about translational motion, which would be changing your XYZ coordinates. So we've all different kinds of motions available to us. In kinetic theory, the gas particles are treated as being dimensionless. They have no volume. They're points. Like in geometry, they don't occupy any space. Um, what we're saying in a more technical way is that the combined volume of all the gas particles is negligible compared to the total volume of the container. And this is one of those points that was done to simplify the theory so the math became manageable. In kinetic theory, the collisions between the particles are completely elastic. Now this is a physics term, all right, meaning that the total amount of energy isn't changing. All right. The average kinetic energy of the particles does not change as long as the temperature of the sample remains constant. All right. So we can transfer energy but the average kinetic energy isn't changing as a result. What's happening as the gases move around in their container, they are going to hit the surface. Right, so as they hit the surface, they're going to exert a force over a certain amount of area. And this average force over area is the pressure exerted by a gas. So the pressure exerted by a gas is caused by collisions of the particles with the walls of the container. More collisions means you have a higher pressure and vice versa. Another statement of kinetic theory for gases says that the gas particles have no attractions for each other and no repulsions for each other. They're basically unaffected by the presence of the other particles as they move around randomly in their container. The absolute temperature of a gas, we're talking about Kelvin, is a measure of the average kinetic energy of its particles. So as the temperature increases, the average kinetic energy of the particles increases. We have a direct relationship. All right. We are talking, of course, about Kelvin temperatures here. This does not mean that all of the particles are moving at the same speed. Quite the opposite. The individual particles move at varying speeds. We actually have a Gaussian distribution, a bell curve. All right, so the blue line here is showing a sample of gas at zero degrees Celsius. And we've got this distribution. Some are moving very slowly, some are moving very quickly. The red line is showing the average, the distribution of the molecules or the particles at 100 degrees. You'll notice at 100 degrees, we have a much higher fraction of particles at the high end of the molecular speeds. Right? So as your temperature increases, we're saying that the average kinetic energy is increasing as well. But we still have a wide range of molecules, right? So uh, for the, of molecular speeds, and so we can talk about average speeds changing at the different temperatures. Now, 
kinetic theory all right, basically is defining ideal behavior. And we do really mean an ideal here. All right. A gas that follows all the points of kinetic theory is called an ideal gas. But all, in reality, all real gases break down in terms of following this to some degree. Right? We call these deviations from ideal behavior. All right. One way we can get a deviation from ideal behavior is in terms of pressure. All right. As the pressure on a gas sample increases, you get more and more deviations from the ideal all right, so here's the ideal gas in this graph. It's a straight line. All right, this is the behavior of an ideal gas. For actual gases, as the pressure increases, if we look at uh, the red line, which is hydrogen, all right, as the pressure increases, we get farther and farther away from ideal behavior. All right. at, pre at low pressures, at pressures below oh, about 10 atmospheres, all right, the deviations tend to be small. But as a rule, all right, as the pressure increases, we get less and less ideal behavior. All right. So if you have high pressure, you should not expect ideal behavior. You're going to get real behavior. Now, temperature also has a role. All right. Now, again, we have plotted the behavior of an ideal gas at different pressures. And an ideal gas would be represented by this dashed line. Now, at 200 Kelvin, you'll notice the deviations from the ideal are quite pronounced. At 500 Kelvin, they're a little bit better. And at 1,000 Kelvin, they're, they're significantly closer. So at high temperatures, right, you get more ideal behavior. Right. So to sum this all up, if you want ideal behavior, or the closest you can get to ideal behavior, because, of course, nothing's ever perfect, you're going to get the closest you can get to ideal behavior if your temperatures are high and your pressures are low. You're going to get real behavior. In other words, lots of from ideal behavior. at the opposite end of the spectrum. If you have low temperatures and high pressures, your gas is not going to behave ideally. You're not going to be following kinetic theory. This is, all right, and we need to talk about why this is. Now, if you go back to kinetic theory, it says in, for an ideal gas, the particles are dimensionless and they have no attractions for each other. Well, we know this isn't true. We know that atoms have radii, All right? And so we know that real gas particles have finite volume, All right? And so when you take this into account, it's called excluded volume, All right? You can't ignore the volume of the gas particles themselves relative to the container and expect the math to work out beautifully, All right? So the excluded volume effect is important. All right. And if you're at high pressures, this excluded volume is largely what's giving rise to deviations because as the, the particles come closer to closer together, the volumes of those gases is going to be more significant relative to the volume of the container. All right. Well, we also said that ideal gases have no attractions for one another, and of course we know that's not true as well. We talked about polar molecules. Right? They're going to have very real attractions for one another. All right? 
and uh, real gas particles are attracted to one another. We'll talk about the details of this in more depth in Chapter 11. All right. But you can, if you look at this picture here, here's a gas particle ready to collide with a wall. All right. Now, if that gas particle is attracted to other gas particles, its collision with the wall is not going to be quite as forceful. All right. And so this is going to have an effect as well on the behavior of the gas. Um, so if the temperatures are low, all right, um, their kinetic energies are low, but they still have the same intermolecular attractions. And so we have to keep that in mind. So we have two reasons really why real gases don't quite follow kinetic theory. Right? They have excluded volume and they have attractions. We can talk about this mathematically in terms of the van der Waals equation. What the van der Waals equation does is modifies the ideal gas law. Which, of course, I talk about in a separate podcast. What it does is introduces two, po two constants to try and make it work better and give, you, give us better explanations of what's going on. If you look on your green sheet, your equation sheet, the van der Waals equation is there. Now, as far as I can tell, you're not expected to do any calculations with this. Basically, you need to know the van der Waals equation from a conceptual viewpoint. We need a constant to talk about excluded volume, and we need a constant to talk about attractions. And that's basically what the van der Waals equation does here. The um, constant A takes care of the excluded volume, and constant B is taking care of the intermolecular attractions. All right. And so we're doing some corrections here. Uh, and van der Waals was a, was a Dutch scientist who was very interested in these relationships. All right. I should mention that the values of A and B are different for each gas. Each gas has its own excluded volume. Each gas has different degrees of attraction for itself, for other molecules of that. Um, and so I just wanted to show you here, very briefly, the range um, that we can get for excluded volume effects and the range that we can get for intermolecular attractions. What you basically need to know in terms of the van der Waals equation right, is that we have excluded volume effects and we have attractions. And those are the real take-home message about the van der Waals equation. I don't want you worrying about the equation because I certainly won't be asking you to do calculations with it. But know that these are the, the terms that were introduced and this is what we're trying to address. I hope you find this helpful and we'll talk another time.